Welcome to the Ad Watchers, a podcast brought to you by the National Advertising Division of BBB National Programs. We're a team of attorneys with 50 years of experience investigating and resolving disputes over the truthfulness and accuracy of national advertising campaigns. I'm Hal Hodis. And I'm LaToya Sutton. To make sure advertisers can back up what they're telling consumers, we don't just take ads at face value. We put them to the test. Why? Because advertising law is simple. It's the execution that's hard. Welcome back to another episode of Ad Watchers, NAD's podcast that gives a view into how our organization reviews claims and applies advertising law. Uh, If you missed any of our previous episodes, don't forget to check them out later. They are available wherever you are listening to this. Hi, LaToya. Al, I am just so super excited today because we're talking about puffery. The absolute, without a doubt, most important legal issue to have ever graced the annals of advertising law. So, um, (laughs) LaToya, now that we've established puffery in the hierarchy of advertising law issues, what what is it? Um, I think a, a great man once said that puffery is a mystery wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in a Twinkie. Um, uh, that's that's me misquoting Seinfeld, misquoting Winston Churchill. Um, so, in all seriousness, while there's no universal definition of puffery, it's generally described as an exaggerated, blustering, or boastful statement, or a general claim that could only be understood as an expression of opinion, not a statement of fact. Um, These types of statements do not trigger an expectation with consumers that it is a fact-based statement um, in evidence and does not require evidentiary substantiation. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that was a really good description. It is a hard thing to define in practice. Um, and, and sometimes we say in our decisions, although we try and I think we try and do this a little less now because it's not particularly a helpful statement, but it, 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 is, it is true, which is that determining what is and is not puffery is often more art than science. Um, so again, I, you know, that is the case. It's really hard to sort of draw that line in a vacuum um, without sort of having the example that you're addressing in front of you. Um, But that, that concept sort of ideals and uh, it sort of highlights uh, that there, there often feels like there's a lot of subjectivity that goes into this decision of whether or not something is a claim or, or, or if it's puffery, right? So, you know, it's hard to sort of really make it objective criteria there's often a lot of sort of subjective assessment of what's going on in a particular advertisement when you're making this decision. Right. There's a little bit of, uh, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder going on. And so there's been even, you know, a little bit of a scattershot approach with the federal courts, you know, different jurisdictions kind of have their own specific definitions of what puffery is. So there's there's not a ton of consistency out there, which is why we at NAD have tried to set a few guideposts for advertisers in our decisions. Yeah. So, so you know, puffery comes up in a lot of our decisions and it's often argued, you know, that a particular statement is puffery. Uh, and through our many cases that we've published on this, um, there, there are a few questions that we sort of tend to ask that clearly sort of help us sort of clarify our determination uh, as to whether or not a statement is or is not puffery. So, so one question that we ask ourselves is, does the representation at issue deal with matters that can be proven, right? If a statement that is, you know, alleged to be puffery is about a measurable attribute. It signals to consumers that the attribute has in fact been measured and that the statement is one that is based in that measurement. Right. Another one is whether the statement is distinguishable from other representations about measurable characteristics. Context is always key in ad interpretation, and here it's no different. 
Yes, that's definitely true. You know, even if the statement isn't, you know, about the attribute, if it's surrounded by them, it's going to be it, it, those other statements sort of provide context for, for the for the for the one that, that is or is not puffery. Um, and then we also ask, you know, whether or not the ad uses wording or, or phrases that convey that it's an opinion, like an expression of opinion, and that, which would signal to consumers that the statement is just the brand's point of view and isn't a fact that they have proven about their or a competitor's product. So, you know, if a consumer knows that this is just like the hot take from the brand um, and not like a definitive statement about what's going on with the products in this marketplace, um, the advertiser, you know, doesn't need to prove it as a claim because consumers don't, don't see it that way. Um, and then it would be, that's, that's another type of sort of puffery statement. So, you know, those are kind of, you know, some of the broad guidelines that can be drawn from our cases. And regular listeners of the pod probably would recognize that now is when we usually say that's the easy part. And then we segue into a deeper dive on our topic. But here's the thing. There is no easy part with puffery. Um, like we were just talking about, there's no clear definition. And while we think, you know, the guidance in our decisions is helpful, there are endless scenarios and fact patterns that could bring up new and unique issues as far as making that, you know, case specific determination of what is puffery. Right. That's the hard part. And here's the hard part. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> today we're going to do things a little differently. <laughs> today we're going to do things a little differently. Uh, we're, we're doing a little experiment on the podcast. Um, in order to illustrate how NAD analyzes claims or statements that may be puffery, we've come up with a game. Uh, Latoya, I am challenging you uh, to a puffery battle royale. Um, we are going to go head to head presenting examples that we think illustrate or best illustrate various types of puffery and, and uh we uh and sort of like the goal is to have something that epitomizes the uh, a particular type of puffery so we're going to have categories and we're each going to come up with an example we have not shared them with each other um and uh you know, it, it, we're going to have a little contest. Right. You know, and I'll be the first to say that Hal is going down. Um, but in order to decide whose puffery <laughs> is the puffiest, um, we have a surprise special guest, our colleague, Eric Eunice. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. Thank you for having me, Hal and Latoya. I'm very glad to be here on the greatest advertising law podcast in the universe so are you playing this game too are you getting are you getting in on the examples here or are you the judge come on <laughs> so uh what, what i what i believe i've gotten myself involved in today is is this game and uh hal and latoya are going to give me examples of uh, we're going to go through four different kinds of puffery and um i'm going to pick the best example. We'll do it SAT style, what we think most uh, best epitomizes that category of puffery. It may not be a perfect example, but I'm going to hear their pitches for, for their example and why they think that example fits into the category. And uh, as we've been talking about, we hope that this gets uh, gives people some more guidance on uh, navigating what is puffery and what isn't. Those are some of the um, most spirited and interesting discussions we have around NAD because, um, you know, as, as we've been saying, it's, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. So I'm going to be the, the judge of Hal and Latoya's example, and I'll choose the winner in each category. The person who gets the most wins gets my hearty congratulations and a virtual handshake. So am I right that you don't know each other's examples? Yes, uh, we sent them to you to make sure we don't have the same examples, but that's it. That we have not seen. I, I don't. I don't know what Latoya has come up with, and uh, unless she has some spies, she hasn't figured out what I, what I've picked either. So, category one: 
puffery that presents as an exaggeration of a product or brand superiority such that consumers would not think it has actually been rated as such by consumers or any other entity. Latoya, let's hear your example first. Okay, so my first example is a case involving uh, baby formula. Um, It's an NAD case from 2001, and the challenger was me, Johnson, and the advertiser was Nestle. So the core claim at issue was bring out the very best in your baby. And the challenger took issue with the use of, you know, the very best in the in Nestle's ad campaign in general. They said that on its face, it's a superlative claim and that when this slogan is coupled with, you know, other claims that talk about the product's ability to provide increased levels of nutrients um, that older babies need, it communicates to consumers that the reason that the formulas are the best is that they provide better nutrition than the competition. You know, the advertiser Nestle just, you know, argued that it brings out the very best in your baby is a non-objective general statement that does not connote superior performance. Um, And they also argue that it's always set off in like a different font and, you know, kind of visually distinct in its advertising from any other claims. So NAD concluded that the slogan, bring out the very best in your baby, standing alone in a non-comparative context was puffery. Um, It explained that the term best does not refer to any specific product attribute and therefore is unlikely to be interpreted by consumers as comparative or fact-based. And, you know, just practically speaking, that makes sense. The very best modifies the baby, not the product. And, you know, there's no real meaning to what is the best baby? What is a better baby? You know, how would that be measured? Like it giggles more, like it's less gassy. Like, you know, there's, this is a, I think, you know, (laughs) just quintessential puffery. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's my example of, you know, puffery as a superiority claim. Well done. Let's hear from Hal now. Ooh, that was a tough one. Tough, that was really good. That was deep, that was deep into lie. the archives, Latoya. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so my example comes from the 2006 comedy by Mike Judge, Idiocracy. Okay, this movie is about a future in which, uh, 500 years in the future, in which most uh, people in the world are uh, not so sharp. And uh, some people from modern day are who are just average in contemporary times are the smartest people in the world by far in the future. In this futuristic world of not so sharp people, um, they are convinced to replace water with a sports drink called Brondo. Okay, and the tagline for Brondo is the thirst mutilator. And there's another claim for the product. It's what plants crave because they start watering the crops with uh, Brondo instead of water and they all die. I don't know if that's puffery, what plants crave. I think that's a provable claim, uh, which I would say is unsubstantiated and certainly consumer unfriendly because, you know, <laughs> they're, they're in a, an agricultural crisis in the future. But the thirst mutilator, that is definitely an exaggeration. That is puffery. Only the unreasonable people of that idiocracy future would believe that this product mutilates your thirst. That is an exaggeration. It is just an expression of uh, pride in the thirst quenching ability of Brondo. It is an exaggeration and certainly puffery that a reasonable consumer would not think uh, was based in fact. A little outside the box. <laughs> well, I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to determine this one without getting into what, who a reasonable consumer is in the Mike Judge cinematic universe and try to put it in uh, 21st uh, century America. Um, I think you both presented excellent examples of, of that of that kind of that kind of puffery. I am going to side with Latoya's example here. For, for a few reasons, I, I, I think that I take the point, which makes it 
very which makes it puffy and, and I think the advertiser took some care there. Uh, talk about the baby and not the ingredients. I think the bringing it at bringing out the best in your baby, I think points to things we see in advertising, you know, happy, smiling children. And, and that's a, that's a very, uh, it, it gets to a more ambiguous, emotional uh, sense of feeling. Talking about, while I think that the, the Brondo example, the thirst mutilator, that's it. The mut- mutilator is, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a, an, an extreme uh, description there, but it, it could also be, you know, a, a synonymous with eliminator, um, thirst ender, you know, it's just mutilator. Cause, cause that's, I think the, the nature of the comedy in that, in that film. So there, it's possible, though I wouldn't say for sure that there's an there's a uh, there's an objective claim about the thirst quenching properties of uh, uh, of the beverage. So I think point round one goes to Latoya. I I will admit defeat. That was a very good example, Latoya, and uh, I think <laughs> I think I think you actually did have the best example there. So I'll 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 concede when I've lost in in truth. So. <laughs> Okay, let's go to um, category two, puffery as an opinion. I think this might be a harder one, and I'm uh, very interested to hear what your examples are. So on this round, let's go to Hal first. Sure. So it actually dovetails very nicely with the toy's example about getting the very best from your baby. You know, best, this is sort of a, 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 um, a better claim in relation to the product itself you know a well-known litigation decision about puffery was from pizza hut versus papa john's in which papa john's argued better ingredients better pizza and it was found to be a combination of two non-actionable statements of opinion better ingredients make better pizza a statement of opinion um nad shortly thereafter had a similar case involving ketchup which said, so it's a 2004 case about Hunt's ketchup, and they said, better tomatoes make better ketchup. Pick Hunt's. I mean, right on the tails of the Papa John's case, it's like their marketing people had read the decision, and I'm sure they did. Um, Our decision tracked with that uh, litigation, and we found that without more, that the entire statement is just a slogan or a statement of non-actionable opinion. It is an opinion that if you use better tomatoes, you get better ketchup, and that you should pick our product because we think it's our opinion that it is the best. Um, And better is one of those terms that is hard to determine if it's puffery or not puffery, Um, but when you're using it uh, in a vacuum where it comes off to consumers as an opinion about your product and not an actionable uh, a measurable attribute uh, that you are comparing your product to your competitors, then um, then then it, it is uh, can be puffery, and you know the danger really comes when those better statements are combined with other comparative claims about attributes of each product. And so, just like in the Pizza Hut versus Papa John's example that is cited in many arguments about puffery. Uh, we had our own sort of version involving ketchup, and it tracks very closely the other example. So I'm not using the Pizza Hut Papa John's expected example. I'm going a little bit to the B side of that and, and going to better tomatoes make better ketchup pig hunts. Can you tell me a little bit more about the context? Was that a was that a standalone tagline? Yeah, line? yeah. It was it was an analyzed as sort of a standalone tagline about about the ketchup. Um, in the Papa John's case it was found not to be puffery when they combined it with other claims about the ingredients, the actual ingredients that go into Papa John's pizza and the actual ingredients that go into pizza Hut pizza. That was not puffery, you know? And so, so there's a dividing line in the pizza hut, Papa John's case. And in our decision, we also track that, um, that same dividing line. Thank you. Let's, let's hear from Latoya. 
Okay. Yeah, I did get a little nervous that you were using the quintessential puffery example there, Hal. But, you know, I, I think that that was actually a really, really good case. And this one I think is going to be maybe a little hard for Eric because I went a similar route kind of talking about a claim that, you know, deals with that better, best and, you know, context specific determination of whether or not it's puffery. Um, my case is from 2017, and it involves almond milk. And the claim at issue um, was the best almonds make the best almond milk. And the advertiser, uh, Blue Diamond Growers, you know, kind of used this. It's another claim that they argued was a, a statement of corporate pride and just pride in their product. And the challenger argued that, you know, when it was uh, made in specific television commercials, the context made it, again, comparative. Uh, they argued that the statement was preceded by a, another claim, almond breeze tastes so good because it's the only almond milk made with California grown blue diamond almonds. The best almonds make the best almond milk. And so there the challenger was arguing that because there's this claim about taste that, you know, the product tastes so good directly before, you know, the tagline and it's tying together, you know, this taste claim, the exclusive use of California grown almonds that consumers are going to take away a comparative claim that, you know, this product, uh, objectively tastes better or is better than the competition and that would require substantiation. Um, you know, the advertiser said, you know, these claims are separated uh, spatially and visually in the, the ad and just, you know, the fact that even saying that the product tastes good, you know, that's just another statement of opinion and together, it just does not add up to enough um, to make it an objective claim. NAD determined that the tagline, even when viewed in the entire context of the commercial, was a message of uh, Blue Diamond's corporate pride in its product and not a comparative claim. Uh, the, fr the phrase, the best almonds, simply refers to one ingredient, the ingredient the company is most proud of, and the advertising didn't depict or um, refer to any competitors or any competitor's product. And so, uh, therefore, consumers are not likely to take a message, uh, take away a message that the almonds used in the product were of a higher grade or in any objective way better than those of the competition. So... I think, you know, this is also a really good example. I think Cal's example is really good too. Um, but I think this is a good example of, you know, <laughs> you know, opinion and, and corporate pride. Thank you guys. Um, I think we have two excellent examples here. And, uh, you know, it's no, it's no surprise that brands will boast about the ingredients and they put, they put in their products when you're, when you're selling food or drink. Um, it's, it's comforting to know that, uh, that the brands are, are proud of, of what they're putting in the product. Um, I think we have, a, we have another close call here. I think they both, these are both good examples of puffery as an opinion. Um, but I'm going to go with Hal on this one because of the narrower scope of the claim and it being a tagline, um, leading to more more ambiguous takeaways when it's it's better ingredients it's harder not to read it as just a, a statement of, of pride and product while there may have been some arguments the other way in the almond milk case so we have a tie we have one one going into round three so category three puffery from depictions and imagery claims are not always words neither is puffery Give an example when something is communicated via imagery that was puffery and not a claim. Let's go to Hal on this one first. All right. So I'm going to go to a case involving a taste test. 
Uh, the case involves Campbell's uh, and their Prego tomato sauce. And they had a taste preference claim. And the imagery of the ad had a split screen of two uh, toddlers, babies, about one year old or so, uh, eating spaghetti and tomato sauce. Uh, one was messily eating up all the tomato sauce uh, and pasta, getting it all over uh, his face. And the other one was messily uh, dumping it on his head, on the floor, just not eating it at all. Um, of course, the uh, the advertisement identified the, the pasta being eaten up as having prego sauce and the uh, pasta that was not being eaten up as uh, the competitor's sauce, ragu. Uh, so the challenger, ragu, uh, which is Mizkin, uh, they uh, argue that the imagery conveyed that this is a taste preference claim for toddlers, for young children, that young children actually prefer the taste of Prego to uh, ragu, and that is something that uh, there was no evidence for. In fact, there cannot be evidence for it because it is well accepted in the taste test world that you really can't get an accurate taste test with anybody under six. Um, so... Uh, we found that the imagery was puffery and that consumers would understand that one-year-olds who could barely talk did not uh, take part in a taste test uh, in which created evidence to support a one-year-old's prefer Prego over Ragu claim. That was puffery. Um, uh, and they did also have a taste test starting at age six and going up, or maybe it was age seven, I forget the details, but uh, that that found uh, a taste preference claim for the two particular sauces at issue in this case. And, uh, and, and they supported that claim. But uh, they, as, as to the message that, that one-year-olds or babies prefer one sauce over, sauce over the other, which came from the imagery itself, uh, we found that that was puffery. Okay. Thank you, Hal. Let's hear Latoya's example. Okay, and this is this is uh, one of my favorite examples. Um, this is a uh, case about a flea and tick killing products. Um, and what was at issue was the depiction of these little green uh, ninjas that were killing fleas and ticks on uh, animals. They were obviously cartoons, <laughs> not real, you know, tiny ninjas. Um, but the challenger took issue with the depiction of these little creatures um, saying that they convey the message that the product you know, works very quickly, basically immediately on application, and that it kills all the fleas and ticks that might be on your pet. The advertiser argued that the animated depiction of little green flea killing ninjas was merely a playful representation of how the product works when they make contact with pests and that, you know, it was just puffery. Nobody's really going to think too much um, about, you know, what these little ninjas are doing. And NAD agreed. And, you know, in one of the more fun lines to read in an NAD decision, um, we stated consumers are not in danger of believing that the product releases an army of ninja warriors on their pets from the advertising, uh, which I just think is fun. And so <laughs> I think that is a good depiction. You know, they, they use, they, they were conveying a message that, you know, the product works, but they did it in a really humorous way that, you know, that showed the activity without making kind of a literal depiction of, you know, flea killing. So that's my short and sweet example for this one. Way to bring in the heat, Latoya. <laughs> that was a good example. I like that case. I thought I had like my like my like ace up my sleeve with the with the Prego case, but uh, that one I, I I almost forgot about that case. I like that one a lot. You can't beat ninjas, so I think that the point goes <laughs> point goes to Latoya on this one. Um, two two excellent examples again of fantastical, maybe uh, or, or or not everyday 
uh, visual depictions. And uh, I, I think in Hal's case, that's correct that uh, consumers aren't going to take away a message about the, the preferences of, of small children. Um, but I think that's kicking it up a notch in the, on the puffery scale when you, when you add the, the Ninja Warriors um, uh, in, your, in, your, in your depiction there. So uh, two to one to LaToya going into the, the final round. Um, and so we, we, there are no ties here on uh, puffery battle royale. So this bonus category is worth two points. So the winner of this wins the match. So for a final category here, why don't you each give me an example of a statement that may have been puffery in isolation, but was presented in the context of other claims that rendered it not puffery. And I believe it's Latoya's turn to go first. Okay. A lot of pressure going into this last round. Um, So I am going to talk about a cold medicine case. Um, It involved NyQuil cold medicine and was uh, brought against uh, Procter & Gamble by Novartis. And at issue, um, I think the claim that kind of changes depending on the context is best sleep you ever got with a cold medicine. Um, And it was used in two commercials um, that were part of the challenge. And at the end of the first commercial, um, the claim is preceded by NyQuil's really well-known tagline, NyQuil, the nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, aching, fever, best sleep you ever got with a cold medicine. And then the second commercial was a little different. It didn't have that kind of commonly known tagline in front of it. It just ended with the, you know, claim at issue. And the challenger argued in both cases that the claim was um, one of superiority and not puffery because best sleep um, is an objective measurable claim. You know, there are different ways to measure sleep. And so... Um, you know, that was an objective attribute that consumers wouldn't take as puffery. And the advertiser had several reasons for arguing that the claim was puffery, that it was monadic, it didn't review, it didn't refer to, you know, kind of any measurable attribute of better sleep. And also the fact that, you know, the claims were long, you know, kind of all of these taglines and kind of the way that it was presented had been longstanding claims in the marketplace that consumers were familiar with the kind of listing off, you know, the, the sniffling, sneezing, coughing, you know, that they weren't going to now all of a sudden, you know, uh, put some really objective meaning towards that just because it, they were using a slightly different tagline. And I think this case really exemplifies how product specific and fact specific, you know, the interpretation of puffery was or is because NAD, you know, kind of considered that, you know, the, 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 I believe the listing of ingredients, you know, kind or listing of attributes that NyQuil addresses had been used since the seventies, you know, and this case was brought in, in, 2006. So it was clearly something that consumers would be familiar with and would interpret in a a certain way because they've heard it so many times. So in the ad where the claim best sleep you ever got with a cold was preceded by that kind of, you know, earworm gets stuck in your, your head, sniffling, sneezing, coughing, aching, fever, best sleep you ever got with a cold medicine, NAD decided that, you know, that was puffery. However, in the other commercial um, where there was a bit of a disconnect because the ad went from kind of talking about the cold relief that the product provided and then straight into the best sleep you ever got with a cold medicine, there, there was an implication that, you know, something about the product would improve your quality of sleep. And 
there, they agreed with the challenger that, you know, sleep is something that can be measured and the claim conveyed a message of superiority. So that's my case. Thank you, Latoya. Let's hear from Hal. So I think great minds think, yeah, I think, I think great minds think alike, Latoya, because I also came up with a classic tagline. I think this one started in the eighties, not the seventies, but close enough. Um, Hefty, 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 wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. Um, If you recall uh, from the, 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 the jingle uh, of the, uh, from hefty, uh, the uh which is made by reynolds uh that's a classic line that's uh been out in the marketplace for for a very long time well they brought it back in a 2017 ad featuring uh professional wrestler and actor john cena uh and also comedian rob schneider uh and it almost acts differently here because here in a vacuum without the context of uh sort of the the surrounding uh scenario we found that in one of the ads a radio ad it was just puffery it did not convey a message about the challenger's bag Uh, the challenger was glad which is made by clorox however in the tv commercial featuring john cena and rob schneider uh there was a uh, a scene with a wall of in the supermarket of hefty bags and a wall of wimpy bags which were yellow and red which is sort of similar to the way a clorox box uh, sorry a a, a glad bag box looks and uh you know rob schneider comments that you know he's being represented by the wimpy box and john cena who's big and strong is represented by the the hefty box and, and and it conveyed the message that the wimpy bags were sort of ineffectual and 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 weak and we found that that image showed that the uh that that glad bags the competitor's bag were weak and also there was a an express price comparison claim to glad at the end of the commercial so um here hefty 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 wimpy 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 in the context of the television commercial conveyed a message that it was actually glad bags that were wimpy 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 that was a comparative claim uh, even though it wasn't expressly stated about the comparative strength of the trash bags. And they could not use that hefty, 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 wimpy, wimpy, wimpy line in the commercial that made it seem that glad bags were wimpy. Um, but in the radio ad, which did not reference glad in that sort of back and forth about hefty, 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 and wimpy, 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 uh, it was okay. It was just the tagline. It was puffery. So here the context uh, of the the price comparison claim and then the trade dress of wimpy being looking like a glad bag was uh, enough to trans transform that tagline into uh, a comparative performance claim and it was no longer puffery wow again we have two great examples here and i, and I think we could go on uh you know for another hour talking about how context changes everything in the in these in these puffery examples um, so I'm gonna have to have to think about this one for for a minute. Um, the best sleep you've ever had with a cold. There's something inherent there where maybe this is normally a context where you have something very measurable, and, and you know we we talk about the this is advertising where you're you may include symptom relief claims. Um, but the best sleep you've ever had with a cold, there is kind of an element there of how do you tra- how do you measure what the best sleep you've personally ever had uh, is? You know, maybe that's maybe that's that's a that's something that standing alone has a strong puffy element to. Hal's example, um, where there is at least where you're doing the the wimpy 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 there's a comparative element there and one of the things we always caution at nad is that when you do any kind of comparative claim it has to be narrowly drawn um the best the best example of this context um i i'm gonna go with Hal's example of context being everything 
because we do have this comparative element here and the the very catchy and sticky and you know it's been around for um years and years the hefty the um hefty hefty wimpy wimpy so that really sticks with you but there's a disparaging element there that uh i I think is is one area where advertisers need to be need to be careful uh when they think they're doing puffery and uh when you introduce a, a comparative or potentially disparaging element to it it may take it out of the realm of puffery so Hal pulls off the comeback and in this uh, very fair scientific sort of contest. A, sort of a tie. Sort of a tie. I'll take the win. I'll take the win I can get. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. You're both winners am, in my book. Thank you. I, I'm happy, you know, to concede defeat where we at least, you know, stumped the judge to the point of speechlessness for a moment there. So I think that means we both did a really good job. <laughs> I agree. I thought your examples were great. And, and I hope that the listeners uh, can take away sort of a little bit about what makes puffery puffery and what makes statements that they think are puffery, maybe not so much. So, Latoya, good game. Uh, both teams played hard. What are some tips and takeaways for our listeners? What did, what did we learn today from this little exercise that, that we undertook with our, with our example game? How how can they help their claims uh, that are meant to be puffery to be viewed as such and not to trigger a substantiation requirement? Well, first, I think, you know, there's there's a key ca- characteristic that ran through our examples and, you know, our case precedent that, uh, you know, puffery is about exaggeration. So if you as an advertiser are trying to make sure statements or some aspect of your ad is viewed as puffery, you should just go ahead and and take it to the extreme. Consumers should be able to easily tell when something is a boastful or blustering statement or when the statement is so far-fetched that it couldn't possibly be supported by evidence. You know, Subtlety is not your friend, and it's not going to hold up well if you have to defend um, your claim against an allegation that it's objective rather than puffery. The second, you know, as we have mentioned many times before, context is key, and no claim should be considered in a vacuum. Puffery is no different. It's important to make sure that a statement that, you know, when you read it or you hear it in isolation might be too vague to be defined, doesn't transform into something tangible and objective due to the context that surrounds it. Um, Those are my tips. But Eric, since you were our supreme judge this week, do you have any tips for our listeners that you'd like to add? A few a few tips on areas to maybe be more cautious or avoid trying to rely on a defense of, of puffery uh, when you're making certain kinds of claims. I would say that in the areas of health, safety, and environmental claims, those are all areas where uh, a puffery, speaking generally, where, where a puffery uh, defense is unlikely or less likely to carry the day. These are these are areas where consumers will typically uh, expect that the advertiser has substantiation for the claim they're making, even if it is a, a boastful uh, kind of claim. Also, in the area of price, that that is something that is um, you know inherently objective. Uh, and when you're so when you're making claims about price unlikely to even even in a very hyperbolic kind of even if they're done in a hyperbolic kind of style um unlikely to be found as puffery i think those are great tips so thank you so much um thank you for joining us eric and everybody that's listening thank you again for tuning into this episode of ad watchers yes uh thanks eric for joining us and for uh, handing me the win. Uh, 
And uh, <laughs> join us next month when we'll be discussing endorsements and testimonials. Um, as always, you can head over to our website, bbbprograms.org, to learn more about what we do at the National Advertising Division uh, or any of our uh, the BBB National Program's other self-regulatory programs. Uh, that's all for this episode. See you next time. Bye, LaToya. Bye, Eric. Bye, Hal. <laughs>